here, and uh, then you can go ahead and grab a seat. Welcome to Riverbank Church. Good to see everybody. My name is Chris, and I'm the lead pastor here. And I want to welcome all of our Claremont family. Can we give it up for Claremont? We love you guys. I'm here in White River Junction. We have our online family as well. Hi, Mom and Dad. Good to see you. I can't see you, but you can see me. Thank you. I'm glad you're here. I love you. (laughs) Welcome. I'm just glad you're here today, and you picked a really good day to be here. I think every Sunday is a good day to be here. Do you believe that? I think it's a good day to be here, and we're going to continue our series in Genesis. Before we get to that, a couple things I want to just run by you, okay? And if you didn't come with a Bible today in Claremont and White River, if you need a Bible, raise your hand, so we'll get a Bible to you. Uh, You're going to need that today, okay? Don't be ashamed. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. This is what we do here, right? Get your Bible. Who brought their Bibles today? Anybody bring a Bible? Yeah, look at this. Hey, now. Okay, get your pen handy, right? Uh, we're going we're gonna to jump back into Genesis chapter 6, um, but so if, as you're receiving your Bibles, I want to remind everybody, Claremont, I want you to hear this, men. White River, you need to hear this. Warrior Conference is coming up, and if, you're, if you are a man in this room, a young man in this room, in the theater, you're online, you need to be there, um, and here's why. A little backstory: When we started this church, 14 years ago. I can't believe it's been 14 years, but when we started church 14 years ago, my friend Derek and I, we were talking a little. He asked me straight up, he's like, what's this church going to be like? And I remember one of the things, we talked about this this week, one of the distinct things that I said, I want to be a church where men can be men. Uh, Masculinity is not something that is frowned upon, but is embraced. I want to be a church where men can be godly men, but can also be warrior men. Amen? And so Warrior Conference is a place where men can go and and kind of get a reset in their life as a husband, as a father, as a a child of God, as a uh, employee, as an employer, as a neighbor. I think it's one of the most important things we do here at Riverbank Church, so much so that we chose to say, you know what, we're going to sponsor and we're going we're gonna to put on a Warrior Conference for the Northeast. So if you haven't signed up for Warrior Conference, you need to do so. If you don't, shame on you. There you go. I, I just shamed men. There you go. But you need to go. It's going to be amazing. It's a great opportunity also to connect with each other. I've met a lot of the men in our church through Warrior Conference. We get a lot of shoulder-to-shoulder time, so make sure you sign up for that. And next, I have some exciting news. Who likes exciting news? Claremont, you like exciting news? Okay, so I love sharing fun things, exciting things. But sometimes when you have fun and exciting things, something else takes a hit. And that's okay, because we've always been a church about making the right decisions and moving forward. And so coming up here in the near future, this summer, you'll be hearing more and more about it. We are launching something called Family Night. Who has kids in the house? Okay, you, you're going to love this. Who doesn't have kids in the house? You're going to love this because I'm going to invite you to serve in this, okay? <laughs> we all get to be a part. Because Family Night, one of the things that we've looked at, in addition to the what we were talking about with men, I, I have a burden in my heart. And we, we just believe it's so crucial that we speak to the next generation, give the next generation the opportunity to know Jesus, follow Jesus, and be a shining light for Jesus in the world we live in, right? And so something we've been thinking about for a while, praying about and considering how can we further engage families in our church besides Sundays is said, what if we were to create a day in the week where we could invite families to Riverbank Church, have an, a, a program and environment for just kids, have an environment for parents, have an environment for, for married couples, have an environment for young adults, a variety of play, people uh, represented. You could go and you could connect, grow in your faith, but essentially we want to create a place for children to come and know Jesus, right? And so this summer... You're going to stay tuned. We're going to begin uh, moving towards that Wednesday night family night. It's going to be awesome. Uh, if you've ever heard of Awanas, anybody ever hear of Awanas? You ever hear Awanas, Claremont? We're going to begin a Awana program here on Wednesday nights, and that'll be awesome for your kids to grow up, better understand Jesus. It's an awesome place for you to serve. In addition to that, we're going to have some marriage group. We're going to have some parenting uh, groups. We're going to have some other groups. So stay tuned. But with that, 
came, comes a shift in our week, weekly programming, which is not going to really affect you too much. Uh, Thursdays will no longer exist, so you don't have to worry about coming on Thursdays. And Claremont, if you're in awe, you're like, whoa, what about us? Thursdays won't be there for you, but you will have a second experience in Claremont starting in July. How cool is that, that Claremont's going to add an experience? And so that's going to give us the opportunity, and here's the, the culture we want to set, is sit one and serve one. So if you're not serving here at Riverbank Church, I've say, I say this all the time, this is not a church for sideline sitters, okay? This isn't a Patriots game where you go and sit in the stands, eat popcorn, and watch everybody do something. No, this is, we're all a part of the game. So I want you to get in the game, and we're going to have plenty of opportunities for you to get in the game with all these new changes, so if you have any questions in Claremont, I want you to know you can talk to Pastor Tom in White River. You can talk to Pastor Patrick, and they will have all the answers you need because I don't have any of them. <laughs> but it's exciting. Isn't that cool? We get to do these things. We get to reach the next generation, and I'm excited about what God's going to do there. So in your seats, uh, at both our locations, you receive one of these. Do you see this? You need to hold on to this for our experience today, okay? Do one of these. Wave it. I want to know you have this. Go ahead. There you go. You're going to need this. I'm going to reference this through our, our conversation today. Let's pray, and we'll get into today's message. Lord, thank you for the opportunity we have to come here, celebrate you, worship you, declare that you are greater than all things. And now, God, as we look at your word, I pray that you would speak through me the power of your spirit, what we need to hear, and what we need to enact in our life, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis chapter 6 continues. If you haven't been with us, I'd encourage you to go online and you can catch up. It's a really important part of the Genesis series, and here's why. Genesis 6 is like a reset button in the world. If you know the story, the story of the flood, the story of Noah and the ark, well, it's a pretty crucial narrative to God's rescue plan. Again, if you haven't been with us, you can go right on YouTube and watch that. But today we're going to continue the conversation. I want, to, I want to talk today about how you and me, how we can thrive, not just survive in godless times. Last week we talked specifically from Matthew 24 where Jesus said that the last days before he comes back, it will be just like it was in the days of Noah. And we unpacked that and we came to the conclusion I think you would agree that we're living in times that are just like the days of Noah. So the question is, is well, how can, we, how can we survive? No, I think we can thrive. I actually think these days could be the greatest of days. Not because we're trying to change anything, because God's plan is God's plan. It's his way. But what we can do is engage in our communities, our neighborhoods, our workplaces, our families in the world, and help change people so that they can meet Jesus and have everlasting life in heaven and have purpose on life in life now. And Noah is a great example of this. Let me show you from the Newer Testament in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, it says this, it was by faith. If you have your Bible open there, you want to underline by faith there. This is a very crucial statement. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. By the way, next week we're going to talk about the ark a little bit. It wasn't a boat. It was more like a barge, just saying. And, but the idea here is that Noah responded to what was going on in the world around him by faith. And it says, he obeyed God. Everybody say, obeyed. He obeyed God, who warned him about the things that had never happened before. And again, it was by his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world. And, and the idea here isn't that, that Noah was shaming the rest of the world. The idea here is that Noah's life of obedience and faith was so impacting the world, everybody's looking upon him and saying, this guy is a do-gooder. This guy is, I could never be like him. And, and they start sh trying to shame him. It wasn't that he was shaming people. It's that people were looking at him and calling him names, and they were mocking him. There was a condemnation towards Noah for his faith. And he received, everybody say received. He received the righteousness that comes by what? By faith. You see, Noah was a man of faith in a very difficult time, in very dark times, in very godless times. And we all agree that the world Noah lived in was a total train wreck of a mess, of a dumpster fire. Are you guys with me? 
It was not a good situation, a lot like the times we live in. But what we also know at that time, and we looked at it last week, is that when God looked upon the world, saw the, the dumpster fire, and saw what was going on, and the Bible said God's heart broke, but he looked upon the world, and he saw Noah, and he saw, he saw the world's situation. He says, I'm going to give him 120 years grace period. That's what he said. And so for 120 years, Noah comes on the scene, and we get to get a glimpse of his life in these dark and difficult times and how he lived during this time of grace. It's something you and me can look at and we can apply into our own lives. Some quick observations of Noah from Genesis chapter 6. First one is this, found in verses 9 and 10. Again, the story of Noah. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a, say this with me, righteous man. If you have your Bible, underline that, a righteous man. He said, the scripture says that he was the only blameless person living on earth. You can underline blameless. So he was righteous, he was blameless, and he walked in close fellowship with God. You can underline that. Very distinct statements about Noah's life right here. Verse 10, Noah was the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So he's a family man. So a couple quick observations if you're taking notes. Number one, Noah was was righteous according to scripture. Now, when it says Noah was righteous, I want you to understand this. Because in our lens, from our perspective, maybe you're thinking like he was a do-gooder, right? You ever know somebody who just, they're, they're just a do-gooder? You know that person? And you almost like kind of look down upon them? I've, I've done this, by the way. I know people like that. They're just way better than me. That's not what this is saying. This isn't saying that Noah was perfect and he was great in everything he did. He, he didn't have all his ducks in an order. That's not what this is saying. What this is saying, though, is that Noah was actively pursuing God and his will. That's what the word righteous means. He was actively pursuing what God wanted for his life. You see, there's a big difference between self-righteous and righteous. Righteous is us pursuing God in his ways. Self-righteous is me. Look at me. Look what I'm doing. Look how good I am. And, and the, and the self-righteous thing is a little distasteful. Are you guys with me? Anybody like self-righteous people? Nobody does. Just so, if you're self-righteous, nobody likes you. Just saying. <laughs> but righteous means we're pursuing God and his will, not perfection, but pursuit. And that was Noah's story. He was pursuing God. He wasn't religious, but he was righteous. He was pursuing God's will. Uh, let's go to back to verse 8. It says, but Noah found favor with the Lord. There's a lot of statements about Noah's life that are some things that we can lean into. Yes, he was righteous. He was pursuing God in God's ways. But secondly, you can write this down, Noah received God's favor. The Bible says Noah found God favor with the Lord. In the original writing, it would be God gave favor to Noah. What we read here, it's almost like he was on an Easter egg hunt and Noah just found it. That's not what happens here. You see, God looked upon Noah's life and because he was pursuing after God, God gave him favor. The idea of favor here is interesting. It means that he receives grace from God. It's like God looked upon Noah's life. He's not perfect. He's not self-righteous, but he's pursuing God's ways. And because he was pursuing God's ways, God says, you know what? That's my, that's my kid. That's my guy. I'm going to open doors for him, and I'm going to close doors for him. And I'm going I'm to give him a pathway to go on. I'm not making him, you know, some self-righteous, superior religious person. No, I'm making him my son. That's my boy. And, and I know this. I have two sons. And my boys are not perfect by any means. And as a son, dad, I know I wasn't perfect and not perfect. But I'm still your son. And boys, you're still my boys. And it's the same idea here that God looked upon Noah and said, that's my Son, that's my 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 guy. That's my young man. That's the guy that I'm gonna I'm gonna bless and I'm gonna bring favor to. But it wasn't just that Noah found favor, and it wasn't just that Noah was righteous. But if you're taking notes, you want to write this down, Claremont. I hope you're paying attention. You need to write this down. Noah was blameless, and this is the one that might confuse us most. But this is the one where I think we need the most clarity so that we can better understand how this narrative plays out. So Noah, when it says he was blameless, and it says it right there in verse 9, that he was the only blameless person living on earth. The idea here that you probably kind of run in your mind is like, wow, he had no sin. And that's not what it's saying at all. 
Matter of fact, if you were to pull back the layers on the original language, it would mean he was unblemished. Now, if you've been with us for a few weeks, you know this, that what was going on in the world was incredibly troubling to God because Satan had come in and he had contaminated the bloodlines. You remember this? Satan saw Genesis 3.15 promise that God said, okay, through this woman Eve, there will be one that comes. She will have a child in the future. And he will be the one, he will be the rescuer, and he will crush your head, Satan. Satan, you'll bruise his heel. But, but this one who will come in your bloodline, his name is Jesus, we know him now. They didn't know in Genesis 3.15. They just knew that there was one coming. And Satan was aware, and Satan said, if I can infect and disrupt the bloodlines of people, then that Messiah, Jesus, will never come. And so Satan was on this witch hunt, if you will, to contaminate the bloodlines of God and his rescuer, Jesus, the one that would come through Eve. And what the scripture's saying here is that Noah, God looked upon Noah, and he was righteous, he was pursuing God, and he had found favor with God, and, and there was this sense that he was, he, was, he was really following and pursuing God, but it was more than that, he was blameless. He was unblemished. Noah's bloodline was not contaminated. It's pretty interesting, isn't it? That God looked upon him and knew this. Actually, he looked upon the world and said, I, can, I, I don't have to destroy everything and everyone, but I can, through this guy Noah, who's unblemished, the rescuer can come. I don't know about you, but that's kind of like a light bulb moment for me. That God was so intentional in this time. So Noah wasn't contaminated by the world around him. He had not been contaminated by Satan's plan to pollute the gene pool and bloodline. Now the truth is, is Satan probably thought he had succeeded. But I love that God always has the final word, amen? He has the final word. And so the race, at this point, the human race had been so polluted that God found it necessary to start again with this guy, Noah. Satan tried, but he fails. Can I just, this is a freebie right here. He tries in your life too. I, I'm not one to give Satan too much credit. I'm not one to give the devil all his flowers. He gets enough on his own. But we know, we're wise, we know that he's trying to come after you. Can I just remind you, he loses in the end always. It might seem like the devil's winning, but he's losing and he's a loser. And you and me are on the winning team, Team Jesus. Continues on. I love this part right here in verse 9. Um, it says that Noah walked in close fellowship with God. That's, that's kind of loaded. That, that Noah found favor with the Lord. That Noah, Noah was righteous. He followed after God. He was blameless. But it says this, that he walked in close fellowship fellowship with God. If you're taking notes, you might want to write that down. Noah walked with God. And when that's stated about somebody, it makes me say like, well, what does that look like? What does it look like to walk with God? What does it look like to follow in God's steps? You see, God finds a man that he can start again with this Genesis 3.15 plan that there's a rescuer who's coming and Noah's bloodline is uncontaminated. He wants, he's pursuing after me in a very complicated, evil, and dark world. And he walks with God. It's interesting the word walked is a big word here. When, when you go back and look at the layers and the meaning and the Hebrew of this word, it's interesting. It simply means an active traveler. Not a passive travel, but an active traveler. Or he's moving. He was moving in his walk with God. He wasn't stagnant. He wasn't stale. He wasn't caught up in the culture of the world. Are you with me? He was walking with God. He was pursuing God. He was actively moving with the Lord. That doesn't mean he was perfect. That doesn't mean he had it all together. It just meant that he was simply walking after God. This is significant. And that leads me to the question for you and for me. Well, how, if Noah can walk with God in, in a godless world, and we all agree we live in a godless world, when you leave here today, you're going to feel it, right? It's everywhere around us. This is a refuge, amen? 
but we can leave here better understanding. I can go into this world that I live in, where I work, where, I, where my neighborhood is, where my family is, where all the things are, where my school is. I can go into this difficult, dark, and evil world, and I can walk with God. So how do we do it? I think we can look at Noah's life, make note, and probably follow suit. So I want to bring, I want to bring these cards back into play. And as, take the card out. Claremont, I want your card out. This is going to be an important piece for us today. Because I believe in order for us to walk with God, to be on that pathway, we're going to be actively traveling and moving with him, we've got to remove distractions. And I want this card to represent distractions in your life. And the truth is, we all have them, don't we? Some of the distractions we have are good things. Most of them are bad things, but I want you to keep this handy because I'm going to walk us through Noah and what it looked like to be a man who walked with God in the midst of darkness and how you and me also can be people of God who walk with him in the midst of darkness, but it's going to require us to take off some baggage, to take off some things that are hindering us, some distractions. So if you're taking notes, number one, we're going to walk with God in the midst of darkness, you've got to know and obey God's word. You've got to know and obey God's word. Now, this might seem a little Sunday schoolish for you, okay? And if I, look, if I'm the enemy, if I'm drawing up a war plan against you, I would want you to think that this is just a simple Sunday school thing. I would want you to just cast this off. It's like, well, it's not that big a deal. I want you to know it's a huge deal. It's foundational to walking with God. If you want to walk with God, you've got to follow what he says and do it, right? And that's the bottom line here. For Noah, in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 14, let me read it. It says, God, I want you to imagine God speaking to Noah. I don't know how this went down. Like the movies try to get it. I don't know if the movies get it. I don't know if God in an audible, echoing voice spoke boldly to Noah, or I don't know if Noah heard in a subtle voice, but this is the words of God to Noah. He says in verse 14, build a large boat from cypress wood and waterproof it with tar inside and out. Then construct decks and stalls throughout its interior. And he goes on and he goes on and he goes on and instructs Noah in verse 22. I want you to say this with me, everybody loud and proud, Claremont, White River, so Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded him. If we are going to walk with God in the midst of darkness, we've got to know that God's speaking, we've got to listen for it, and we've got to obey it and do it. This is what it looks like to walk with God in a dark and evil world. That's what Noah did. He did everything God commanded him. And you and me should do the same. You see, obey, obedience is this word that in our world is almost work we kind of rebel against because we want to do it our own way, especially rugged individual New Englanders, right? I'm going to do it my way. And I'm here today to tell you, if you're going to walk with God, you've got to be willing to say, it's not my way, it's his way. I'm going to follow what he says. I'm going to go to his word and find out what he has to say, and I'm going to do it. That's exactly what one of my mentors said many, many years ago in a conversation. I said, how do you know God's will? Have you ever asked that question for yourself? Like, how do I know God's will? That's a common question in, in the church world. And, and this, this mentor said to me, in such a, it wasn't, he wasn't a jerk. He just said it so, it was almost like confidently. He said this, quote, God's will is God's word, Chris. Find out what God says to do and do it. And find out what God's word says not to do and don't do it. End quote. Isn't that good? Find out what it has to say. You want to know God's will for your life? Boom, right here. I promise you it's not a YouTube video. I promise you it isn't that person at work that has all the answers to everything. You know the know-it-all at work? Anybody have one of those? Maybe you are the know-it-all at work. I'm here today to tell you, if you and me are going to walk with God in the midst of darkness, we've got to know his word, and we've got to obey his word, meaning we have to go to it daily. We can't avoid it. 
We can't just say, I'll check in on Sundays. Pastor Chris will have something. Guess what? If I am the on, your only source of God's word, you've got serious spiritual issues. And you're not walking with God in a dark world. I promise you, you're limping or you're stagnant. But you are not walking with God actively. If you and me are going to walk with God in this dark world, we've got to go to his word. We've got to make his word a priority. And, and the way we do this is simple. Every day, open it up and read it. I'm going to give you a next step, okay, in a little bit. I'm going to give you a direct next step to take on how you can do that. But you've got to do it. And I want you to think about this. Take your card out for a second. What is hindering you? What is a distraction for you right now from walking with God when it comes to his word? Maybe it's your schedule. Maybe you need to change your schedule. You're like, well, Chris, I can't get up early. I, I have so much bandwidth in the morning. Well, maybe you need to change your schedule. Write it down. What is that thing that is taking you away from getting into God's word so that you can find out what it has to say to do and do it and find out what God's word has to say? Don't do it and don't do it. If you're not there, you need to be there and you need to remove the distractions so that you can be there. Secondly, how can we walk with God in dark times, in the midst of darkness. Number two is you gotta let your light shine. You gotta let your light shine. If you're a follower of Jesus in this room today, there is a light there in you. You don't wanna cover it up. You don't wanna, you don't wanna like kind of veil it. You wanna let your light shine. Now, this is interesting. If you look at Noah, chapter six, verse five of Genesis, uh, look at his life a little bit. No, the Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on earth, and he saw that everything, everybody say everything. Everything means everything, okay? No, no trick here. All of it, everything they thought, everything they imagined was consistently and totally evil. Look at verse 9. This is the account of Noah and his family. We read it early, it's worth mentioning it again. Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless person living on earth at the time, and he walked in close fellowship with God. The point I'm making is that Noah stood out. He stood out, and guess what? He wasn't afraid to stand out. Let me ask you this. In this world that we live in that is so, it feels oppressive and dark and overwhelming. Maybe you're even sitting here today and, and you just feel like you're, you're kind of in a refuge away from all of the darkness of your world, can I just remind you that you and me have an opportunity to be light in a dark world? That, that's, how we, that's how we walk with God. We embrace being light. And that's what Noah did. He stood out from the world. He stood out from the way the world lived. He stood out from its culture. As a matter of fact, in 2 Peter chapter 2, Another New Testament reflection on Noah's life, which is really cool, that he's looking back, Peter, the guy who hung out with Jesus, was the guy that Jesus said, I'm going to build my church upon you, the rock, Peter. You're going to be like the first pastor, right? Watch what Peter says in 2 Peter 2, 5. Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. So, Noah, so God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. The point that's being made here is that the key word is warned. What Peter's saying and reflecting upon Noah is that Noah warned, meaning he was active, he was doing, he was shining a light. And I think when we hear the word warned, it's almost like uh, he was a, um, a big mouth. That's not necessarily what's happening here. It was that Noah's life reflected what God was doing. Noah reflected obedience. Noah, he stood out from the world. And, and a lot of theologians and smarter people than me have looked upon this scripture in Noah's life and said he most likely, Noah, was being absolutely shamed by the rest of the world. He stood out. He was being mocked. He was being made fun of. He was probably being threatened in a multitude of ways, yet Noah shined a light in the midst of the darkness. The word warned there means herald. Hark the herald, angels sing. His life was a herald to the world around him. His life preached, God is sent in the flood, so I'm building this big ark. Let me ask you this. In this dark world, where evil just seems to be creeping in on, on a daily basis. Are you a shining light or are you veiled? Or are you just blending in? 
Noah is someone we can look at and say, you know what? He was courageous with his light because his life was on the line with the people. I don't know what was going on there, but it apparently was psycho crazy. And Jesus said it'll be just like it was in the days of Noah, and we're living in similar psycho crazy days. So when you stand out, you're taking a you're taking a chance of persecution. You're taking a chance of people uh, mocking you and smearing you. But when we walk with God, we're good with that because the light is important in the darkness. What does it look like when we walk with God? Well, thirdly, you can write this down: is you got to trust in God's plan. Walking with God means I am walking with trust that God has a plan, and, and I'm 100% on board. Genesis chapter 6, verses 13 and 14, it says this. So God said to Noah, I have decided to destroy all living creatures, for they have filled the earth with violence. Yes, I will wipe them out all, uh, all out along with the earth. Verse 14 build a large boat god says from cypress wood and waterproof it with tar inside and out and then construct decks and stalls throughout its interior here's what's going on god has a plan for noah and the plan requires you to build this ark which by the way had never been done before and noah's like well huh what can you imagine that god's showing up and telling you to do something that's never been done before they're gonna make fun of me god I mean, you realize that this is setting my family up for my, my poor kids, right? Yet, God spoke and Noah trusted it. If we're going to walk with God in this dark world, we've got to trust God's plans. Let me tell you, it comes back here. God's plans and God's ways counter the world's ways and the world's plans. The world's narrative and the, and the way the world views things is counter to the way God views things. You know this, right? And many of us, listen to me, don't be offended. You need to be be honest. Many of us have picked up more worldly habits and worldly views than we have God's views. And if we're going to walk in the light and we're going to be a people who trust God's plans, we've got to be able to reject the views of the world and embrace the views of God and be okay with the world mocking us a little bit. I'm good with it. You get to the point in life where you're like, I don't care. I just want to follow God. I just want to do what he says. I, I want to know his plan, and I'm going to trust it. It goes back to, for us, 14 years ago. This is what trust looks like for me. And I'm sure you have your own trust in God story. But for me, it was when I was fasting and praying and asking God for clarity for the next season of my life. Because I, I was like, I don't know what to do. We were in a great situation, family everywhere, friends everywhere, great church, great life, and the beach really close, and I had a boat. And that is a dangerous thing to go to God and say, God, Tell me what you want to do. I trust you. And when on the second day of a fast, and I promise you, when the Lord spoke to me, I wasn't, ha- I wasn't like the effects of bad pizza because I hadn't eaten, okay? The Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, I want you to move to this part of the country and start a church. That freaked me out. But it took trust to be able to say, okay, God, this is what you want. It makes no sense at all. I knew two people here sitting right there. And I said, okay, we'll go. This isn't Chris giving flowers to Chris. This is Chris saying that it was horribly painful to trust God in that. And I, get, I must be real with you, it's still hard. The hardest thing I've ever done in my life is trust God with this. Let me just tell you, I'm so glad. I hope you are. I'm so glad that God spoke and he gave me the opportunity to trust him. Listen, listen, listen. God has a a plan and a path for each of us. And as you walk with him, he's gonna clarify it and you need to trust him. There's, I call them, micro plans and macro plans 
Macro plan is how we operate in the world around us. Micro plans is how we operate in our worlds. At home. With our callings, our distinct callings. And we have to trust God with them. Let me ask you this. What, what is distracting you from trusting God? Maybe it's money. Maybe it's family. Comforts. We're very comfortable people here in the Western world, the United States. What is distracting you from trusting God? You see, I'm so glad Noah is an example for us on how we can walk in a dark and evil world. And lastly, maybe most difficult is if we're going to walk with God in a dark world, we've got to persevere in faith. The word persevere is a, is a fancy way to say we've got to have patience. And I know in this room are a lot of people who are impatient. I'm impatient. I've been dying for the Celtics to win their 18th banner for years. Hopefully it's this time. Go Celtics, right? But what about my life? Impatient, right? I'm patient with my family. I'm impatient with you know, things going on in my life. I'm impatient with everything. And if we're going to walk with God in a dark world, well, we've got to live a life of patience and perseverance in our faith. Look at Noah in, cha- in chapter 6 and verse 22. We read this earlier. Mentioning it again is important. So Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded him. He didn't, he didn't waver. He didn't try and manage God's commands. Can I just, this quick little message for you. Stop trying to manage God's commands, people. <laughs> Just, just follow them, trust them. But you gotta also persevere through them because watch this, verse, seven, uh, verse five of chapter seven, Noah did everything as the Lord commanded him. It, it was a consistent thing for Noah. He persevered. It was difficult, it was brutal. I couldn't imagine having to build this ark out of, like he didn't have all the tools you and me have. I don't know how he did it. God provided somehow. He got splinters everywhere. He probably worked 15, 16 hours a day, hard labor with his guys. He only had a work crew of five, including himself. Maybe a few more. Maybe the ladies wanted to chip in. In that culture, they didn't have to. Listen, he had to persevere knowing God had a plan. He had to labor through 120 years of mocking, of questioning, of wondering, Life was going on normal around him. For him, his world was upside down. If we're going to walk with faith in a dark and evil world, we have got to have faith before our flesh. Our flesh is our natural tendencies, the things we want, the things that are easiest. Faith says, I'm going to pursue God in his ways. Why? Because I'm walking with him. And I'm going to persevere and have patience through that, knowing that's the easy way. I'm not called to the easy way. I'm called to the Christ way. Walking with God means we persevere even in the face of challenges. Let me ask you this. What are some distractions in your life that are keeping you from persevering? It could easily be comforts, it could easily be a person. It could easily be a place, a job. It could be anything. But sometimes we allow distractions to pull us away from what God really wants us to do, and that is to persevere in our faith over our flesh and our tendencies that come natural to us. So, some next steps. Number one, I, I mentioned this earlier, that we got to be in the Word, right? This is God's Word is God's will. You do what it says, find out what it says and do what it says, and find what it says not to do and don't do it, right? So I want to encourage you this week, everybody, we can all do this. A next step is read Hebrews chapter 11. Will you do that? Hebrews chapter 11. We we mentioned Noah from Hebrews 11, but in Hebrews 11 is a list of people like you and me who had a greater faith than what the world was kind of pulling and tugging at them. They had a greater faith in the midst of all kinds of challenges. Read Hebrews 11. We do that? It's a next step. Another next step is baptism. 
This is, this is big for people because many of us grow up thinking we're good, right? I did it. I'm good. I, you know, I, 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 when I was a baby, I, was, I did that. And, and can I just want to tell you that baptism has nothing to do with when you were a baby. It has to do with when you followed Jesus, when you began your journey with Jesus. And then after that, you're like, I want everybody to know it. That's what baptism is. It's a beautiful illustration and public example in public declaration that I follow Jesus. And so if you've never gone public with your faith in baptism, Claremont, White River, online, I want to give you the opportunity to do so. It's easy. You can go right on the website. You go on the Church Center app, or you can ask a servant at your location, how can I be baptized? And we will make it so easy for you, and you get a free t-shirt. Okay? And then, lastly, your, your card. I want you to hold on to this because we're going to come to a place where I'm going to invite you to respond with your card because I believe we all have a next step to take and your card might be, and I believe everybody in this room, this is your next step, but we all have a next step. Will you pray with me? Thank you, Lord, for this day and the opportunity we have to come here and worship you and celebrate you and be challenged by your word. And I'm asking you, Lord, that you would stir our hearts today, that we would be a people that are tuned into what steps you want for us to take. God, you've called us all to walk with you. So help us to be honest about where we are with you, God, and take our next step. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. And maybe your next step is a first step. We talked about walking with God in a dark and evil world. And uh, maybe you came here today and, and you're like, I don't, I don't walk with God. I, I know about him. Like I know or I've heard or I've been, but I don't walk with God. Uh, matter of fact, I don't even know God. You, you can't walk with him unless you even first know him. And so maybe you don't know God. And, and I just want to speak to that real quick. It starts with you. If you're going to know him, it starts with you being real about you and honest about your own life. See, we live in a world that everybody says, I'm good. Ask him, how you doing? I'm doing great. But the truth is, is everybody in this room, including me, is not great. The Bible says it real clearly. It says, for all have sinned and fallen short of God and his glory. That's a, a way to say everybody is jacked up. We're all sinners. Sin means wrongdoing. It, it simply means missing the mark. It's like, a, it's like an archer. We have the Olympics coming up this summer and those archers are pretty amazing when they pull back their archery and they aim for a target and they hit the target every time. Well, sin is we miss the target every time. We screw up, we lie, we cheat, we steal, we sleep around. We, we do all kind of crazy. The Bible says that sin, and that sin causes a broken relationship with God. The problem with sin is bigger than a broken relationship with God. You see, the Bible is really clear, and you know this in your heart of hearts. Everybody knows this, that you have eternity drawn there. Like, you know that this life is temporary. I know it. You know it. We try to numb it or forget it or ignore it, but the truth is, is everybody in this room knows that there's more to life than this life. There's something beyond this. And we're faced with that reality all the time when, with death, right? The scripture says in Romans chapter six, for the wages or the consequence of sin is death. See, death is a reality we will all face. But here's the truth about death. It's just the end of this life. And God has created you again with eternity. It's on your heart. You know it. It's in your heart of hearts. Matter of fact, when you were younger, you knew it more. As you get older, you get more cynical and you want to ignore it and you want to just block it out. But the truth is, everybody in this room will die and everybody in this room will spend eternity somewhere. And that's where the consequence of sin comes into play. You see, without our sin removed and without our sin, our, our wrongdoing taken away, without it, us being made right with God, we have a serious sin consequence that we would face. And that sin consequence is eternity separated from God in a literal place called hell. And that is a problem. 
And I hope as you sit here today, you feel the weight of the problem of sin and the consequence of sin. It's a serious problem. It's a serious issue. But I'm here today to tell you there's hope. And the hope, let me just qualify it, isn't religion. God hates religion. He hates what we do with religion. He hates how we, we flaunt ourselves. He doesn't appreciate self-righteousness. That's not what this is. The solution, are you ready, is God's love for you. Wait a second, Chris. I'm a sinner. I'm jacked up. You said if I die without my sins removed, I'll spend eternity in a place called hell. I thought you said, you know, like that sounds like God hates me. No, 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 no. God loves you. But see, God is holy and perfect and we're not. And until we're made right, until he makes us perfect, not that we become perfect, but we're made perfect through him, we have a serious problem, and that's where God's love comes in. It says this in the Bible, for God so loved the world. Put your name there. For God so loved Chris. Watch this. For God so loved Chris that he sent his one and only son, Jesus. And if Chris believes in Jesus, for, for God so loved Chris, that he sent his one and only son, Jesus, that if Chris believes Jesus, he will be rescued. He will be saved. He will be forgiven and given everlasting life in heaven. My friends, it's the greatest gift exchange you could ever imagine. You see, when we believe that God did for us what we can't do for ourselves, through his love and his son, Jesus, we receive everlasting life in heaven and forgiveness of our sins in an identity that has eternal implications. So my question for you is this. Do you know Jesus? You see, the Bible says that God sent his son Jesus to die in our place. He paid the price on the cross for our sins so that we don't have to pay the price with our life eternally. Jesus died in our place. Watch this. He was buried, and then three days later, Jesus conquered death and hell, erupted from the grave to give you and me the hope of everlasting life in heaven. My question for you is this. Do you know him? Do you know him? You can't walk with him if you don't know him. So if you're in the room today watching online and you're like, Chris, I don't know Jesus. I want to know him today. How do I do this? I want to make it super easy for you, but at the same time, super hard because it's going to require boldness to say yes to Jesus. I'm going to do this. I'm going to count to three in just a, in just a minute here. And when I get to three, I'm going to invite you to boldly, courageously, no matter what, stand to your feet. Chris, I want to say yes to Jesus. Let me count to three, okay? Invite everybody to close their eyes, bow their heads. A private moment, but a bold moment for some. I'm going to count to three. And if you want to be rescued by Jesus today, you want to begin your relationship with him so you can walk with him in this difficult and dark world, I want to give you the opportunity right now. I'm going to count to three. And when I get to three... I'm going to invite you to courageously stand to your feet. One, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says. Believe. It doesn't say be moral. It doesn't say be religious. Believe, and you'll be rescued. Two, today is the day that you can be rescued. Right here, right now. You can follow Jesus today. And if that's you, three, whether you're online watching or in the house, three, stand to your feet. Chris, I want to believe today. I know this is hard for some, but do it. God has you here right now. Stand right where you are. Chris, I want to say yes to Jesus. Stand right up. Stand up. No shame here. If someone came with you, yeah, I want you to invite the person next to you. Say, all over the room, say, hey, I'll stand with you. Go ahead. I'll stand with you. Go ahead. Do it. You can talk right now. I will stand with you. Go ahead. Awesome. Yeah. Anybody else? Today's your day. Here's the thing. I, I'm so proud of you. Look at me right now. Wherever you are here, I'm proud of you. Yeah, right here, I'm proud of you. I want to connect you with my friend Paul right here. We're going to hang out for a few minutes. Get a Bible in your hands. Yeah, come on. Yeah, you can come. Awesome. You can. Yeah, come on. Yeah, 
My friend Darren will hang out with you. That's cool. Yeah, that's cool. Lord, I thank you for rescue. (laughs) Thank you that your message is the most powerful message of all. And that you are the hope giver even in the most difficult and trying and dark of times.